So a couple of things we're going to start off by saying. What? All right. Um, you're here because you're pissed off. You have every right to be pissed off. I'm pissed off too. But the problem with being pissed off is it tends to like run off in multiple directions all at once. You need to be pissed off about the right things. It's taken me a long time to figure out what I think the right things are. So I want to share that with you. You can disagree about that. But I think we need to be on some kind of same page. Otherwise, you're all just getting written off as a bunch of cracks and discontents and malcontents. So we need to do something better than that. I came to the United States 20 years ago. I wanted to join an open, inclusive, plural, multicultural, exciting society. 20 years later, I don't know what the hell happened. So you know the numbers on this, but I'm going to remind you of them because they should be emblazoned into your forehead so you remember this. So if anyone talks to you about this, we're all on the same page. In 2007, the top 1% of the United States takes home 24% of all the income. In, 19, in 1976, they took home 9%. Since 1978, the bottom 40% of wage earners have seen their income stand still. There has been no real wage increase when you adjust for prices. The top 1% currently have 38% of the country's wealth. The top 400 Americans own as much as the bottom 150 million. 47, Americans, 47 million Americans live in a family of four on less than $22,300 a year. 52 million Americans have no health care coverage in the richest country in the world. This isn't the place I joined 20 years ago. This is Brazil in the 1960s. This is Mexico in the 1970s. This is the income distribution Can I make sure of a I didn't developing mishear you? country. Can I make sure I didn't mishear you? Top 100 and bottom 150 million. 400. 400. 100, 150 okay. million. So there's plenty of injustice to go around on this. But I've been asked to talk about austerity politics, the idea that basically we've all spent too much and now we have to cut everything back. All right? Well, here's the thing. Who's actually spent too much? Well, we hear is the government spent too much. There's been an orgy of government spending. Yeah, the funny thing is, if you actually look at really the numbers, it's kind of not true because there's a 76% jump in government debt since 2008. What happened in 2008? There would be the $2 trillion we paid to the banking system to not fail, and then the $2.2 trillion in executive compensation they've awarded themselves since that point. So when you take account for that, I mean, if there was an orgy in government spending, it'd be kind of nice because we'd see it. There'd be new schools, Amtrak wouldn't suck. You know, there'd be things that we'd actually have things to point for. And clearly that hasn't happened. So in a sense, where has all the money gone? Well, it went basically to support the financial system. That's where it is. There's been no orgy of government spending. This is a big myth. It's not true. There has been a lot of government spending. It all went to be all the banks. 87% of it is a direct payback. Either recapitalizing, re-liquidating, or alternatively propping up the financial system. Now, if this is the case, you see this massive increase in government debt. What's the second order injustice? The second order injustice isn't just the way that things have worked out distributionally. It's the fact that we're being asked to pay for it. Well, so we're going to get it straight, right? So the people who have got all the stuff screw up. Then they get bailed with our money, and now we've got to pay it back. I mean, this is literally the deal that we have been asked to sign on to, because we've all spent too much. Now we have to have the moment of austerity. Really, that's a pretty strange way of thinking about it. So the rich screw up, and the poor get to pay for it. That's a good one. Why did we get into this position? Well, many people these days say that we shouldn't have bailed the banks. And I'm one of the people from right from the start said we had to. And I'll tell you why I thought that and why I've actually changed my mind about this. So it goes like this. There are 158 million Americans in the labor market. That's how many of us go to work every day. Of that, 72% of us rely on paycheck to paycheck to make our payments. They have no savings because of that income skew, because of the fact that we just don't have income. We also have 50, 55 million handguns. So imagine what would happen if there were no money in the ATMs, if we really did let the whole system go down, and there's no groceries, and it goes on for days, weeks. That's an ugly place. So everyone got frightened, and we thought we have to bail these guys, because if we don't, I mean, they do, they provide paychecks. They put the money in the ATMs. I mean, how are we going to get groceries? How are we going to put food on the table? Of course we need to do this. They had us over a bottle. We discovered those magic words. Too big to fail. And at the time, I didn't realize the significance of this. 
but the significance is truly profound because what it means is too big to fail is you can never let them fail. And if you can never let them fail, they don't fail. So just like the bratty teenager with indulgent parents who gets to do what it wants because it knows that the mom and dad's going to bail it out no matter what, they're going to take every excessive risk they damn well can and award themselves the bonuses they want no more. And you won't be able to do a damn thing about it because at the end of the day they're too big to fail. Now what was the quid pro quo for this? What was meant to happen to make this okay? They were going to make the magic come back. They're going to bring back growth. That's the deal, right? Everything's going great. Look, we're all fine. Look, my house is going up in value. Everything's fabulous, right? I mean, you know, 2006, we weren't doing this in 2006. We were worried about Britney Spears' comeback in 2006. Yeah. That's where we were. It's, it's wonderful. Let's bring it back. Let's bring back the magic. But what was the magic? The magic was credit. The magic was more debt for people who haven't had that income increase in over 20 years. The magic was taking more money out of your house on the assumption that somehow like a magic money pump, it had magically increased in value, you could take out this whole equity line of credit and spend it on what? On healthcare, on your kids' education, on things that you should be able to afford in the first place. But they couldn't bring it back. You talk about why, basically it's because their business model's dead, but I won't bore you with the details. But like the dinosaurs of old, the meteor hit, it takes a while for them to eventually die off. So you don't need to worry about Wall Street dying in the long run, it's already there, trust me, I can tell you why. But, in the short term, they've got what bankers call a free option. They basically get to play, you have to pay, regardless of the outcome. We are their insurance policy. And when you have that written into the fabric, when you have that as the basic standard operating procedure of an institution, they will abuse it, just like a bright teenager. Now given all this, we're still being told that we need to cut back. We need to get rid of that terrible government debt. But there's terrible private sector debt. And if we all cut it simultaneously, all we do is make the whole economy shrink. More to the point, I don't hear so much about the people who have got 38% of national wealth really paying back for all the good things that they had over the past 20 years. So there has to be a question of equity. There has to be some kind of question of fairness in this distribution. It's absolutely true, student debt is out of control. And the chances of a labour market where you've got a real unemployment rate of 16%, that's what it really is. When you're going to go out there and somehow pay back 40, 50, 60, 90 thousand dollars in student debt, so you're basically barring poor people from going to college. The formal access doesn't matter a damn. When you've got people who cannot pay hospital bills, how does getting a credit pump again, how, do, how does this work? Clearly we need to think a lot harder than this. But simply punishing the people who don't have to pay for the mistakes of those who did seems to be the most ass backward thing you could imagine. But yet, that's precisely the position we find ourselves in today. Even Obama says that we've spent too much and we need to cut it back. Well, just be honest then, admit that 87% of our spending since 2008 has been on these guys and not on us. Because if it was on us, then the proof would be on us and we should pay it back. But I don't see myself flying off down to Providence every day when I go to work in a brand new super electric train because of the orgy of infrastructure expenditure that's gone on. Mm -hmm. I don't see school outcomes for like grade schools going through the roof because of hiring so many teachers. So that's just not the case. This is the greatest bait and switch in human history. Two trillion dollars of private debt gets smuggled in and rechristened as two trillion dollars of public debt and now it becomes the public's problem. The public didn't generate that. So how do we get out of this? Don't focus on the trivia. Don't focus on esoteric schemes. Don't focus on the fact that we're going to reinvent all of capitalism. Maybe in the long run, maybe the oil crisis is coming in 20 years will take care of that for us. We don't know. But here, right now, just a simple one. Too big to fail is morally, ethically, and economically wrong. Yeah. Everyone should have to bear the responsibility of their actions, regardless of whether they're citizens or bankers. And if that's the case, the one policy that we need to do is a very old one. In 1933, it was called the Glass-Steagall Act. That's right. Yeah. And you cut it right in yeah. the middle. And if you want to run that casino with other your friends' money, great. No backstop. You don't get to write that on us. We are not your insurance policy. Captain goes down with the ship. I got no problem with that. Go well, if you make a gajillion dollars in your investment, fine. You do not come to me when it goes wrong. And then the other part of it, the commercial banking side, then they might actually pay attention to us. Then they might, rather than being seduced by the possibility of a 40% return on a currency swap, 
actually invest in a business, actually open up something that will create jobs, actually restore hope. Remember that one. So that's what we need to do. One simple thing, tell everyone, it'll make a difference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. My name's Eden, I'm part of Free School University. I have these little pieces of paper. You can find our schedules there. Also, I'd like people to move forward. We need to keep about a third of the sidewalk, certainly everything behind the tree open for the passers-by. Anyone who would like to sit down, please do so. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Eden. Well, as I said, for those of you who are new, my name's Kevin Gallagher. I uh, teach at Boston University. I want to thank all of you for uh, for waking everybody up. You know, I, I'm an old dude. I wake up in the morning, I read the paper, I get grumpy, and I think a lot of Americans did too. We're just sitting here getting grumpy and getting depressed and so forth. And you folks said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go out there, and this thing is swelling on a weekly basis, and it's it's great to see. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for having us to come out here and uh, and talk about it. I want, to, I want to talk about two things and pick up on, on something that Mark, uh, Mark has been talking about. And we've we got to be a little, we got to be really careful about what some of our targets are. Um, and I want to talk about two targets um, and talk about their global, global implications. Um, I want to talk about credit rating agencies and trade treaties. These are two